Welcome to the What's Your Ceiling Podcast. We're your hosts, Monty Wyatt and Paul Szynski. Wherever you are in life, there is a higher ceiling. This podcast is how you become aware of it and how to take action to push through it. It's time to discover your ceiling. Welcome to the What's Your Ceiling Podcast, where we talk about your health, your family, your business. I'm Monty Wyatt, and I am excited to have our guest with us today. And we're going to have a great conversation. He's not only from an, a fellow Iowan from Mount Pleasant, but he is a former FBI hostage negotiator, a author of the best-selling book, Never Split the Difference. And he trains and advises Fortune 500 companies on complex negotiations. So I'm looking forward to some great stories, some great ways that he has broken through ceilings, but also how he has helped others in his in his coaching and training so chris welcome to the show monte thank you very much happy to be here you bet chris voss i'm I'm really excited to have you on the show and and i've read your book and and it's really interesting to hear some of your tips and i'm i'm looking forward to having you share some of those tips as well always have a, a topic to the show and today's topic is life is negotiation so chris when you hear the phrase life is negotiation what comes to mind for you? Yeah, well, I view uh, negotiation as collaboration. Great negotiation is great collaboration. It's also a good synonym for navigation. You know, you're trying to navigate some obstacles. You're trying to negotiate obstacles. So it's about moving forward in life. Uh, and you move forward with people, not against them, uh, in a sustainable way. I mean, you could beat people every now and then, but it's a net loss, but it's about great collaboration and succeeding in life. You know, I, I love how you put that. It is a, it is succeeding in life because every day we negotiate where we're going to have dinner, what we should do for the day, where we should go. And I, I love how you said it. It's moving forward with people. Yeah. Yeah. So I, yeah. And it, it was true. All the, all the little negotiations and uh, People think they're only in a negotiation when money's at stake, but the commodity that's always there is time. And where we're going to go have dinner, that's, an, that's where you're going to spend your time. Um, it's Time is the commodity at stake. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, how did you get into negotiation and how did you get into this industry? Yeah, it's just one left turn after another. You know, uh, I was in law enforcement, uh, decided... From my mid-teens that I wanted to be a cop. I picked out Kansas City, Missouri. My father strongly encouraged me to go federal. I'd gone to Iowa State University. He uh um he uh sorry. He um um paid for my college degree and I went and got a job that only required a high school diploma. So he encouraged me to go federal. I was on the SWAT team in the FBI, re-injured my knee. Wanted like crisis response, you know. Uh, I'm I'm very much an action oriented person. I believe inaction is one of the great problems of mankind. Uh, to sort of paraphrase, maybe what John F. Kennedy said: the risks and costs of comfortable inaction. And in crisis response, somebody has to make a decision. So, hostage negotiators were involved, and I decided. I thought, you know, that'd be cool. I'll try that. How hard could it be? <laughs> and. Uh, like things that like things that people make look easy, it was really uh, complicated, and I I loved it more than I I love SWAT. I love negotiation more, and then became the FBI's lead international kidnapping negotiator. Ultimately, a couple twists and turns along the way, and left the FBI and thought, well, you know, these ideas maybe they apply to regular life, and it turns out they do, and the book has done really well. Oh, that is fantastic. That is fantastic. You know, I, I'd love to hear a story uh, that you have of a negotiation that you've done that's that's been pretty intense and and challenging for you, because I, I know that's that's a big part of of life is we all have those challenging moments. But I'd, I'd love to hear one of those negotiation stories. Well, a, a hostage negotiation story that, that I'm uh, really proud of that almost nobody knows about. Um, uh, Steve Santani was a Fox News journalist. He got kidnapped in about 2005-ish time frame in, in the Gaza Strip. And 
he just disappeared. He and, he and his cameraman just vanished. And the Gaza Strip is a fishbowl. I mean, it's a very small contained environment. There's no shortage of intelligence about what's going on there. Bad guys are everywhere. Intel agencies globally are everywhere. You know, it's a, it's one of the flashpoints of the world. And, you know, people who either are trying to fan the flames of discontent or trying to tamp them down and create peace, everybody knows what's going on in Gaza. And for somebody to disappear entirely, everybody thought he was dead. Everybody thought he and his cameramen were dead. They were buried under a basement someplace. And I got I got involved in a case, no demands, no trace, nothing. And then suddenly, bang, bad guys were talking. And we got proof of life early on, and we got a partial proof of life. Mm -hmm. I remember working with a Fo Fox was very supportive and doing everything they could possibly can to get Steve and his cameraman out. And so they, uh, I integrated closely with them. And we sent the proof of life through because, you know, everybody was sure that they were dead. And they answered the questions half right. And the Fox people were like, wow, this is, this is, you know, uh, we're on the right track. And I said, no, 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 no. Half right ain't good enough. And they were really afraid to push back on the, ba the bad guys saying like, look, if you can't prove they're both alive, we got no deal. And suddenly the negotiations changed at that point in time because the bad guys realized that instead of dealing with amateurs on behalf of the Fox people, they were pros on the other side. Mm. And things moved very quickly and uh, Fox worked very hard. And very shortly, uh, Steve and his cameraman were out. And I was really happy that we got in the middle of that and it worked out well. Wow. That that just sounds like a pretty intense and and you know, it, it, both parties have to be be willing to listen and listen to to understand. Is that correct? Well, we were willing to listen. Um, the other side was being very aggressive, and <clears throat> it's being li listen to understand. But a, a, an important part is also drawing a boundary, drawing a line nicely. You know, and that's what we did um, when we got partial proof of life. We just said, "Hey, guys." It's you're half right, you know, uh, you, you get it all the way right, and we can work this out, but uh, you got to get it all the way right. It's disagreeing without being disagreeable, mm. I think, is one of the real key issues there. Yep, I like that. Disagree without being disagreeable, very good. You know, re relate that process that you go to to the business world. A lot of our a lot of our audience, the achiever, is business owners, executives. Tell us how we can how we can tie into what you you do on a daily basis, and even that story to the business world. Well, the real critical issue is uh, first of all, be a straight shooter. There's a difference between somebody who's direct, which is blunt and honest. Nobody likes a direct person. You know, you feel like, uh, and I, my, I'm a natural born assertive. There's, there's basically three types. Uh, an approach to negotiation, approach to conflict. It's fight, flight, make friends. Uh, the person who's very assertive, the person who's very analytical, and the person who's very relationship-oriented. And each one of the three types brings it, skills to the table that are simultaneously essential and inadequate. Mm. Um, you have to be assertive, but you have to be able to disagree without being disagreeable. You have to be able to assert your best interests. But, and that's what a straight shooter does. A straight shooter is honest with you. They just do it in a nice way. You know, they combine honesty, assertion, while simultaneously protecting the relationship. And I think that's one of the really critical issues. How can I disagree with you without making you feel slapped in the face? How can I tell you, uh, relate to you what I want, what I need? without seeming too aggressive or too greedy. Balancing those things is essential. And I think that's what most people, business people do because they're really good at one of those three things. They're really good at telling people what they want or they're really good at protecting a relationship or they're really good at thinking things through and considering all the options and being very deliberate. And what you need is sort of an alchemy, a blending of all three of those to really be a great person to collaborate with. Like if you and I are making a deal 
and I and I want you to do well, you're gonna have to tell me what you need. Mm-hmm. You know, because otherwise, if if you aren't somewhat uh, forthcoming in your needs, then you're making me guess. Yeah. And the chances that I'll get it right are diminished significantly. I might get it completely wrong because you didn't tell me you were too busy trying to be nice mm. or you were too busy thinking things through. I mean, you got to tell me what you need. And so each each one brings things to the table to really to really do a great job. That is that is interesting. I love that. You know, you you got to balance and protect the relationship while getting uh, being assertive and really getting what you need and making it you're sure yeah. you're expressing what you need. Yeah, yeah, and, and in a business deal, I mean, it's, I think this is one of the problems with supply chain negotiations because um, the supply chain people on behalf of Walmart, on behalf of uh, any of the big box retailers, Home Depot, you know, Walmart's sort of the most famous one for being really tough on their suppliers. But, uh, you know, I got to make a profit. Otherwise, I'm going to go out of business. I'm not going to be your supplier anymore. Mm-hmm. And not only do I have to make a profit, I'm entitled to a reasonable profit. And so to get your cutting my price to get your business is a great way for me to strangle myself. And it's not good for either of us. Right. Right. Absolutely. Tell, tell us another story about the, the business world. And, you know, you don't have to tell the company things like that, but how you've helped them think through their options to protect relationships and making sure that they're negotiating for what's best for them. Well, when things are going bad and um, people need to repair relationships, one, one of our strategies, which is a bundling of our skills, uh, we refer to it as the accusations audit. Uh, let me articulate all the things that you think are, are uh, that you're worried about, that you're afraid of, the accusations that you hold against me. And it's a way of really clearing somebody's head because accusations in someone's head against the other side is negative thinking and you're 31% dumber in a negative frame of mind, at least 31% dumber in a negative frame of mind. Hmm. So the accusations audit is a way to disable and deactivate negatives by calling them out. And it, it's, it's, if that's the only thing that you learn, you'll make much better deals. Now, what does that look like? Uh, you know, you're probably thinking I'm lazy. You're probably thinking I'm slow, you're probably thinking I'm, I'm disagreeable. We get a call a couple of years ago, a woman is trying to settle with an insurance company and it's two weeks before the statute of limitations runs out where legally the insurance company doesn't have to settle with her family any longer because her family has drugged their feet. What happened was her father had gotten um, a second degree burns by being uh, uh, burned with hot water in, uh, in some sort of hot tub device. And um, his his daughter was trying to settle it out. And her mother was just, the whole process had just drained her mother emotionally. And Mm -hmm. the trauma that her husband went through made it difficult for her to deal with constantly. An insurance company actually made several offers, low offers. um, And mom in her uh, emotional distress just hadn't responded. So daughter's picking it up two weeks ago before the clock runs out legally where the insurance company has to pay. Not only is it two weeks to go, but it's December. Hmm. And, you know, it's hard to get anything done anywhere in the world in December. I mean, whether we like it or not, it's largely a Christian driven English speaking world uh, mostly. And of course this is in the United States. So December people are going to Christmas parties. They're getting ready for the holidays. Even if they're not Christian, you're coming up on, uh, New Year's and the end of the year. And and if you're Jewish, it's Hanukkah. I mean, December is a hard time to get anything done other than go to a good holiday party. <laughs> so <laughs> she reaches out to the insurance company with an accusation on it. You probably think we don't care. You probably think we're inattentive. You probably think we're lazy. Derek Gaunt, who's our top negotiation coach, has coached this lady write down all the negative reasons they're going to be angry with you. They don't have to make sense. They don't have to line up that nothing logical. She came up with 15 reasons Hmm. why the insurance company, the person 
because it's an insurance company, but you're still dealing, dealing with a person on the other side. They settled for five times what had previously been offered. Wow. In December, and the settlement came two days before Christmas, which means this lady who could have put it off that was dealing with it on behalf of the insurance company, she could have said, hey, look, I'm on vacation for the next two weeks. I'll be back in January. She, They made the deal. Huh. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, it was, so, a great, it was a great interaction. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, so, and some people would say, well, they should have done that. Well, it's a shitty world, right? Mm -hmm. What people should do and what they actually do are often vastly disconnected things. Yeah. Wow. That that's that's incredible. That close to the deadline and they didn't really have to do anything. No, they could have drugged their feet on it, you know, the, the, uh, easily. Easily. And the you know, the plaintiffs, if you will, um, you know, they procrastinated. You know, it, it it wasn't your insurance company's fault that they failed to respond to any of the offers. Right. And, but, you know, any, any of these things, it, when you got human beings involved, uh, emotions are involved and uh, emotions drive vision and vision drives decision. Mm hmm. That's very good. You know, I, I'd love to, to hear how you have had to grow in your process of negotiation. You know, we, again, the title of our show is What's Your Ceiling, where we all have to break through our next level of learning or our next level of challenges. Share with us what you've had to learn and what you've had to break through in your career. Well, constantly um, keeping myself on track, you know, the negotiations with myself. Uh, human beings uh, in our survival mode, you know, which is how we how we wake up each day how we're wired from the beginning, from the caveman days, the limbic system, if you will, the amygdala, the hippocampus, all those crazy terminology for the different portions of our brain. Our normal survival mode is negative. Um, mm -hmm. As a layman, I can get away with saying this because I'm not a neurologist, although I, I soak up everything I can about that topic. It's safe to say that we're 75% negative. And that's what we inherited because in the caveman days, if you will, something that would, is negative will kill you if you don't learn the lesson. Mm -hmm. um, something that's positive it ain't going to kill you. Um, but if you make a mistake on something that's negative, you know, a bush that you shouldn't eat, an animal you shouldn't get close to, um, water that you shouldn't swim in, you make that mistake more than once, it'll cost you your life. Uh, and pos we don't react like that way positively. So why am I going on and on about this? Success mindset is largely optimistic. It's largely positive. That's not your normal state of being. You wake up, the default mode that you wake up in is negative. So what do you have to do? You got to you got to practice mental hygiene mm -hmm. the same way you practice oral hygiene. Right. You know, I got a daily gratitude practice and it doesn't have to be first thing in the morning gratitude. There's all sorts of formats to it. Um, feeding the spirit, if you will, the optimistic side of your spirit. It could be your religion. It could be exercise. It could be um, a meditation. Um, I listen to Andrew Huberman all the time. He's got all these practical tools for taking care of yourself. Um, yoga Nindra, uh, non-sleep deep rest. I mean, there's all this different for formations that you need to keep yourself in a positive success success mindset hmm. because you'll lapse into the negative mindset. Do you got to do this every day? Do you brush your teeth every day? That's why I like to think of it as personally as mental hygiene. Not only do I brush my teeth every day, I got to brush my teeth at least twice a day <laughs> in order to take care of my, my oral hygiene. And I, and I think psychological hygiene is the same. And it's just because, so I'm human, I struggle with this all the time and I'm constantly working on different ways to put myself in a positive mindset so that then I can negotiate well. Like my favorite time of the day to cut a deal as a general rule is I like it about 10 ish in the morning for me and about 10 ish in the morning for you. 
because I'm going to be most likely in my positive, optimistic uh, mindset at about that time. I got coffee in me, you know, mid morning. I haven't had a big carb heavy lunch. You know, I got plenty of mental gas in a tank. I'm actually in a playful, I can be at my most playful at about mm. that time of the morning. And consequently, just because of those general guidelines, it's going to be the same for about you. You know, if I, if I got to get you on the phone and we're going to have an enjoyable conversation where I get a good deal and you're really happy with the outcome, pretty good chance it's going to be the same time of day for you. You're going to be your most flexible. You're going to be the most open-minded. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not the only time you'll be open-minded. It's just, you know, I'm, I'm playing the percentages. So I'll, I'll try to cut a deal with you at about 10, 10, 30 in the morning. Oh, that's fascinating. I, I, I love that mental hygiene and psychological hygiene because I think you're exactly right. Every day, every day we've got challenges in front of us. It's how we approach them. It's how we think about them. And our, our mind determines our success. A uh, thousand percent. Yeah, a thousand percent. And, you know, um, what was it? Somebody asked me the other day, uh, you know, the, the mind-body interaction. You know, taking care of our body because our body houses a brain. The brain works better, and then you get a great you, you get a great loop. I mean, one of the main reasons I take care of myself physically is because I'm trying to keep take good care of my brain. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I I love that you shared that because I think that's that's something that uh, our listener, the achiever, needs to do every single day is keep their mind focused on the right things and. Whatever your habits are, you got to find your own routine, your own way of doing it, whether it's gratitude, whether it's exercise, you name it. But everybody's got to find their routine. I don't I don't know anybody who that whose success I respect um, that doesn't do that. A thousand, thousand percent. Like there are a few people that who are by some measures are successful that don't do that. But, you know, I got to tell you something. Um, yeah, Donald Trump, I think that life is a game to him. I think he's having a ball, uh, having fun on the outrageous things that he says, uh, testing the waters. I, th I think he actually delights in life. And I'm not sure that people would normally describe his demeanor as that. But I, I got to tell you something. I think he's having a ball at what he's doing, which is, uh, that would just be another example. You know, love him or hate him, pick anybody on any side of the spectrum. Uh, they're probably having a great time doing what they're doing, which means, you know, there's there's a there's a mental hygiene there of, of enjoyment. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. You know, you you mentioned successful people. You know, how do you how do you define success? Oh man. <laughs> what is the meaning of life? That's, That's almost, right. That, that question, right? Uh, you know, well, for me, um, success is having a positive impact on a planet, uh, enjoying my life, getting smarter all the time, learning all the time, making a good living, you know, uh, uh, do a lot of good, uh, have a lot of fun, make a lot of money. Uh. Now, there isn't anything in there about perfection and there isn't anything in there about the absence of failure or the absence of downtime. Um, and as a human being, I'm struggling with all these things at the end of the day, yesterday, there was something I did that I thought was a failure and I was down about it and a couple of spiritual, you know, good night's sleep, couple of spiritual practices cleared my head. I'm like, all right, this is behind me. And then as it turns out, just before I came on uh, the show with you, I got a phone call and the thing that I thought failed had actually succeeded. Hmm. And two things occur to me. First of all, I'm ecstatic. And then the other thing is like, I, I put myself through, <laughs> you know, this, unnecessary unhappiness yesterday <laughs> like i was wrong and it was all perception and you know your question is about success um and it was some all you know stuff that i just put myself through and, and a lot of it is how how we filter in this you know how how we put it in place 
uh, the old classic, is this happening to me uh, or for me? And if, if you can, and you can, if you can re reroute anything to for me, um, I, another person I admire very much, uh, it died several years ago, Sean Stevenson. Uh, on his on his deathbed, he looked at his friends and said, "This is happening for me." So, mm -hmm. you know, su success might might just be added. I I love that you said said that because it it does happen to it happens for us and it's how we respond to it yeah. and, and that's a, that's a lot of the world is how do we what are we getting out of it be based on how we respond to it instead of how we react to it yeah and then, yeah i like that a lot well said yeah there's a big difference between responding and reacting and i think the world is challenged by that <laughs> you know that it, it, the constant reframe among successful people among negotiation what you just said is a is a theme of nearly every thinker out there and i've heard it so many different ways you know uh, an early uh um, business negotiation book that let me know that hostage negotiation applied to business jim camp wrote a book called start with no back in 2002 and jim used to call it the re re reaction <laughs> yeah <laughs> trying to get you out of the instantaneous reaction and i think if you go all the way back to the stoics uh, i just picked up marcus aurelius's book meditations um it's all about that you yeah. know how how are you how are you responding versus how are you reacting yeah absolutely uh, th thinking from two thousand years ago right yeah yeah i love it i love it so again our our audience is the achiever want to really encourage everybody to to take a listen to what we're talking about here today it's about balancing uh and protecting relationships and being assertive but it's also about making sure that you are uh knowing what your boundaries are and uh, and i think that's a critical thing you know just uh just one a few more questions I'd, I'd love for you to give just our basic listener a couple tips on negotiation. If there were some basic things that you would say, hey, when you're when you're talking with somebody, even if it's going out to dinner, what's a, what's a basic tip of negotiation you would encourage? Um, you know, let the other side go first and make sure by checking in with them that you understand what their point of view is. Uh, no matter what that point of view is, uh, it could be something you completely agree with. It could be something you completely disagree with. The, the act of making somebody feel heard is insanely transformative. And the, in point of fact, they'll probably give you some really good information in the process. Like uh, one way to uh, be successful in a negotiation is to be smarter at the end of it than you were at the beginning. Mm and gather some information. The other side's always going to have stuff that can enlighten you. They're always, always, always going to have stuff that gives you insight or gives you valuable information. And you don't gather information when you're talking. Right. And you actually, while you're thinking about what you want to say, you're also not soaking in information. <laughs> you know, just being silent is not the same as listening. Right. Um, so, you know, make sure that you actually hear what's said and you think about it. Um, it'll inform you. It'll make you smarter. You'll be better off than you were. And you're always going to get a chance to have to say what you want to say. You know, if you, if you, if you're talking about, if you're talking about Colorado, uh, Colorado Buffaloes and Deion Sanders, you know, hearing what the other person has to say, no matter how much you're burning on, on what you have to say, it doesn't matter what the topic is they're going to have a perspective. They're going to have information that's going to enlighten you and they will be delighted mm -hmm. that you listened and they will enjoy the experience that much more interested. People are interesting. You want to be the most interesting person in the room, be the most interested person around. And so if you make it a practice to hear people out, you'll always make better deals. Always, always, always. I love that. Be the most interested person. Yeah. That's that's great. And make sure you are listening, not just hearing. You got to be listening. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and listening, I, I guess it, it's, you know, contemplating, reflecting, analyzing, thinking about what the other side said. And, you know, again, I mean, um, I'm Deion Sanders comes to mind because I think um, maybe one of the hidden things why so many people globally admire him and that uh, are, are astounded by is he's coaching his own kids successfully. Yeah, like there ain't a they ain't a dad out there that wishes they could coach their, their kids as successfully as the insane. Like, how how the hell is this guy doing this? Like, <laughs> like his son is not calling him an idiot publicly, and I'm thinking or his sons, uh, you know, plural, obviously. And I'm I'm just gobsmacked by this the other day, thinking like, yeah, not only is Dan's kid, you know, a quarterback and a safety, not only these guys ridiculously good at it, but they're happily playing for their dad. I'm like. You know, I didn't want to go to work for my father. <laughs> and and my son is as independent as I am. My son, Brandon, helped me build the company. And and he, you know, got tired of his old man telling him what to do. And he's he's now uh, independent of me. And I'm I'm thinking it's a father-son thing. And the, and the other day, I want to bring this up with, again, Derek Gaunt. And I just kind of throw this out there. And Derek went through the same thing with his daughter. Like, his daughters are phenomenal athletes who did not want to play for their father. <laughs> and I'm thinking like, yeah, this just isn't a father son thing. I mean, this is a dad thing, period. And if I hadn't given Derek the chance to sort of throw out his feelings about coaching your kid, it would never occur to me that the dynamic was the same with him and his daughter or that he'd spent that much time coaching his daughter in her, in her younger years. Yeah. So I learned so much about him uh, just by letting him go first. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I really appreciate you sharing that. You know, one of the one of the questions that I ask every every one of our guests is, what do you want to be known for? So in in all of your impact that you've had in the world and and influence you've had on others, what do you want to be known for? Like if if I become known for bringing more empathy to the world. And empathy is not sympathy. Empathy is not agreement. Empathy isn't even compassion. It's a precursor to compassion. But empathy is just like demonstrated understanding. Mm. Like if, if, if some kind of way, you know, never split the difference, which is a business book primarily, but it's also a personal relationship book. You know, its impact on a planet is it brought more understanding, which leads to agreement, but is not the same as agreement. And I think that would be a cool thing uh, to be known for. I love that. that uh, demonstrated understanding is what empathy is, and that's what you want to be known for. I love that. That's great. Yeah. yeah. You know, I've, I've taken away a ton of different things, uh, and, and I want to just review a few of them. I've got a whole page of notes here and, and I want to share some with our, with our audience, but negotiation is about uh, collaboration. It's moving forward with people and, you know, a couple tips that you gave is let the other side go first and making sure that you understand their point of view. And so they feel heard and you hear what they say. Um, I, I love that you said, uh, be able to disagree without being disagreeable. And, and so you are protecting the relationship. So just love those tips. Really appreciate that. Any, any other tips you want to leave us with here today? No, I think, I think those are, uh, those are good. I mean, uh, to, to make yourself when it's time to be heard, your tone of voice has a complete impact on whether or not the words land. Yeah. Um, with a great tone of voice, you can say almost anything. Uh, with a bad tone of voice, no matter how nice the words are, they probably bounce off. Yeah. And so, you know, being aware of how your tone is causing the words to land is massive. Oh, that's great. That's great. Well, how can our audience get a hold of you or learn more about you and your services? Well, the coolest thing we're doing these days, we just started on this social media platform called fireside uh, it's a subscription service you find the app on the app store and your phone whether it's iphone or 
and uh, Android, I think is the other platform. But here's what's cool about it. It was originally pitched to us as an interactive podcast, live podcast. People that are listening on, on video come up and uh, ask questions of me, and usually I have a guest. But what has turned out to be is group negotiation coaching. We run an hour a week. Every week, somebody on my team runs an hour of coaching. We bring up a topic. We probably talk for about 20 minutes, take questions. You can answer questions on the topic or whatever negotiation question you have. And then when I realized that we were doing group coaching, I went back to my team and I said, wait a minute, this is coaching that we're giving people. Like, what do we normally charge for coaching? We normally charge $5,000 an hour, an hour. And the fireside costs a thousand dollars a year. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Chris, I really appreciate your your time, your your insight, your stories, and you have been a fantastic guest. And again, love that you're from Iowa. Love your book. Love that you're uh, you're out making making the a difference in the world. So. I do appreciate uh, your time today and to our audience, the achiever, hopefully you've taken a number of notes today and you can be a better negotiator because of today. So thanks for joining us and Chris, really appreciate it. Have a great day, thanks. everyone. Thanks for having me.